The Allies received an unexpected bit of intelligence, if disturbing news, in May of 1917, when an interview with a crewman of a German submarine was published in a Dutch newspaper. The crewman noted that the newest German submarines could outrun the fastest merchant vessels on the surface, and that the Kaiser had 325 submarines in his service. It was a desperate time for the Entente nations. In February, the Germans had resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, and by cutting the line of supply, they had brought Britain nearly to the brink of starvation. But the Entente tactics were changing, and a new ally had entered the war. The crewman that was interviewed in the newspaper was a crewman aboard the submarine SEM U-58, and coincidentally it would be the U-58 that would meet that new ally the following November. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In December 1916, German Admiral Hennig Rudolf Adolf Karl von Holzendorf proposed a daring plan to the Kaiser. The German U-boat campaign had been effective in the beginning of the war, but had been limited since 1915, subject to so-called prize rules that required the submarine to stop a ship and place the crew in a place of safety before sinking it. The limit was to placate the United States, furious at the 1915 sinking of the luxury liner Lusitania. Von Holzendorf's memorandum recommended resuming unrestricted submarine warfare. Von Holzendorf argued that an all-out U-boat campaign would starve Britain and force them to sue for peace within six months. While such an action would almost certainly draw the U.S. into the war, the plan postulated that cutting off the British line of supply would end the war before the U.S. could mobilize enough troops to make a difference. And even if Americans tried to send troops, Von Holzendorf promised that the U-boats would sink the transports, promising the Kaiser that not one American would land on the continent. At first, the plan went as expected. In the first six months of 1917, a quarter of all Britain-bound shipping was sunk. But also, as expected, the campaign drew the U.S. into the war, with the declaration coming April 6. When U.S. Rear Admiral William Sims arrived in London later that month, he was told that if the German submarine campaign went unchecked, Germany would win the war. The Grand Fleet was stretched thin, and the U.S. Navy ill-prepared. The proposed solution was to use a convoy system, a system that Britain had resisted as it delayed ship schedules. Vessels would travel in convoys, protected by escorts, now supplemented with U.S. destroyers. The U.S. sent squadrons of destroyers to the Irish port of Queenstown, now called Cove. Sims would have preferred a base in France, but there weren't enough resupply facilities available. Some of the first Americans to enter the war were sailors based on U.S. destroyers in Queenstown, escorting ships in the Battle of the Atlantic. It was grueling work patrolling the North Atlantic, seeking the elusive U-boats. Six months after U.S. destroyers started arriving in Ireland, the U.S. crews were much more experienced, but had yet to confirm a single U-boat kill. If they did encounter a U-boat, however, they had the service of a new and powerful anti-submarine weapon. Developed by Royal Navy engineer and inventor Herbert Taylor, the depth charge was essentially a mine fitted with a hydrostatic pistol set to detonate the mine at a preset depth based on water pressure. The first successful use to destroy a submarine had been in March of 1916. The U.S. had requested full working drawings in 1917, and U.S. depth charges, called the Mark II, were virtually identical to the British Type D charge except with an improved hydrostatic gun. The barrel-like charges carried 300 pounds of TNT each, were loaded on two racks on the back of the destroyer. The depth charge was a simple weapon, but while they were the best anti-submarine weapon available, they were nonetheless difficult to use. There was no effective way to locate a submerged submarine, and the 300-pound explosive was only dangerous to submarines within about 140 feet. The convoy system worked around the limits of the range and capabilities of submarines of the era. Most submarines could only operate within about three days of base. This placed the greatest risks as ships neared Britain. For most of an Atlantic crossing, a convoy could only have a single escort, but additional escorts would be provided in the danger zone. U.S. destroyers and escorts from Queenstown would escort convoys out of Queenstown west through the danger zone. The ships would meet at a rendezvous point where they would meet a convoy headed to British ports and escort them back through the danger zone. On a foggy November 17th, a destroyer division consisting of six U.S. destroyers and two British corvettes was escorting convoy OQ-20 with eight merchant vessels out of Queenstown. The escort was under the command of 40-year-old United States Navy Commander Frank Berrien. A 1900 graduate of the United States Naval Academy, Berrien had served as the Academy football coach from 1908 to 1910, earning a record of 21 wins, 5 losses, 3 ties. Berrien commanded USS Nicholson. Commissioned at the end of April 1915, the Nicholson was an O'Brien-class destroyer 
one of six United States Navy had ordered in 1913. A development of the Cassin class at 305 feet 3 inches, the O'Brien class was larger than the previous U.S. destroyers in order to mount larger 21-inch torpedo tubes. The ship also mounted four 4-inch four Mark 9 guns and two racks of the new Mark II depth charges on the back. The harbor was protected with anti-submarine netting, so the ships would have to come through single file and some 10 miles out to sea be organized into the convoy formation, in this case four columns of two ships each. This was a particularly vulnerable point for the convoy. The ships were intermingled and moving slowly. The escorts were not in position as they were carrying messages and giving instructions. But convoy OQ-20 was particularly vulnerable because there was already one of the dreaded U-boats in its midst. Part of the German second submarine flotilla, the SM U-58 was one of 12 Type 57 ocean-going diesel-powered torpedo attack boats of the Imperial German Navy. The 219-foot, 10-inch long submarine had a range of some 7,000 nautical miles, could submerge up to 50 meters, or about 164 feet. In addition to a 4.1-inch deck gun, the submarine carried seven torpedoes, with two tubes each in the bow and the stern. The boat was commanded by 30-year-old Captain Lieutenant Gustav Amberger, only eight days into a new command, having previously commanded the SMU-80. Commissioned in August 1916, the U-58 was on its eighth patrol and had sunk 21 vessels already in the first battle of the Atlantic, including the 202-ton British sailing ship SS Dolly Varden just three days earlier, Amberger's first kill in command of U-58. Amberger had previous knowledge that a convoy was going to depart and had been avoiding patrols for two days, waiting for this moment to attack. The day had almost started with a disaster for U-58, as they heard the screws of the convoy, Amberger had taken the boat to periscope death, only to find himself on a collision course with the USS Nicholson. Amberger had to order the engines full back to avoid a collision, but the Nicholson had not seen them, and he maneuvered for another try. As the last of the merchant ships, the SS René, was moving into position, Amberger was lining up to attack the British merchant steamer SS Welshman. Amberger extended the periscope to prepare his attack. The U-58 was in an excellent position to attack the Welshman, but as Amberger looked at his periscope, to his surprise he realized that one of the U.S. destroyers was very close aboard and bearing down on the U-58. The approaching ship was the USS Fanning, moving quickly to assume its position covering the rear of the convoy. The Fanning was under the command of 33-year-old Lieutenant Arthur Carpenter, a 1908 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy who had participated in the 1914 occupation of Vera Cruz. The Fanning was a Polding-class vessel, smaller and older than the Nicholson, mounting 18-inch rather than 21-inch torpedoes and five 3-inch guns. Like Nicholson, she had also had two racks of the Mark II depth charges added to her stern. Coincidentally, this was not USS Fanning's first encounter with U-58. In October 1916, before the U.S. had entered the war, Fanning had recovered survivors of ships sunk by the U-58 off Nantucket. The telescope was the type that the Allies called the Finger Telescope. It was very thin, only stuck up out of the water about 10 inches, and as the U-58 was barely moving, it wouldn't have left the V-shaped wake that tended to indicate a periscope. So when Amberger saw the Fanning so close by, he quickly lowered the periscope, hoping to avoid detection for the second time that day. And U-58 might have avoided detection for the second time that day, were it not for the coxswain standing watch on the bridge of the USS Fanning. Daniel David Loomis had what one officer described as a most extraordinary set of eyes. In foggy conditions, Loomis spotted the tiny, just inch and a half diameter periscope 400 yards off the Fanning's port bow. Telescope, he yelled. 25-year-old Lieutenant Walter Owen Henry was officer of the deck. He ordered general quarters, called for the rudder hard left and full speed. As Rear Admiral Walter Sims noted in his description of the encounter, it's not the simplest thing, even when the submarine was so obviously located as this one apparently was, to reach the spot accurately. The story would have to make a wide turn, it's easy to miss the spot, but Henry directed the Fanning perfectly, and as she rolled over the spot where Loomis had seen the periscope, they rolled off one of the Mark II depth charges. And they weren't the only ones there. As soon as they heard the report, Berrien had rushed the Nicholson through the convoy. They made a hard left, kicked off another depth charge near the Fanning. The U.S. destroyers had acted quickly, but they knew, after months of service with no confirmed U-boat sinkings, that U-boats were hard to catch, and the depth charges had to be spot on. And there was a problem. The first depth charge had exploded prematurely, had so shaken the Fanning that it had temporarily disabled the main generator. If the U-boat came up in attack position, Fanning would have been unable to maneuver, a sitting duck. 
but the wake from the explosion subsided. Fanning restarted her generator, and Nicholson made a sweep. They were desperately searching for a sign that they had scored a hit, but none appeared. It seemed another frustrating event in what Admiral Sims described as months of fruitless battle with nothing but oil slicks, wakes, tide rips, streaks of suds, and suspicious disturbances on the water. Fifteen minutes ticked by. Had the submarine escaped? But below the surface, Amberger had to make a desperate decision. Fanning's depth charge had struck close. The hull was unbreached, but the shock had disabled the motors and shut off the oil leads, essentially cutting off fuel. Of more immediate concern, the blast had jammed the diving rudders, making the boat uncontrollable underwater. The U-58 was slowly sinking, and Amberger's crew couldn't stop it. If it sank too deep, it would be crushed. The officers discussed the situation and concluded that there were only two choices. Either sink and wait to be crushed, or blow the ballast tanks, surface, and surrender. The boat was at nearly 200 feet, already below its test depth, when Amberger ordered the crew to blow the ballast tanks. The submarine's stern appeared first, tilted some 30 degrees, showing the aft torpedo tubes, and then the conning tower came up. Nicholson rapidly closed and dropped another depth charge close aboard, an explosion throwing the bow up rapidly. The destroyers opened fire with their guns, fanning from her stern and Nicholson from her bow, and at least one struck. The door of the conning tower opened, and Captain Lieutenant Amberger came out. His hands raised in surrender. He was shouting, Comrade! Comrade! The word that German troops used when they surrendered to allies. One after another, the crew came out with their hands raised. Under the cover of the Nicholson's guns, the fanning came alongside, but the submarine started to settle. German officers had been ordered not to allow their submarines to be captured, and so they had sent sailors below to open the seacocks. The U-58 sank before it could be taken under tow. As the boat sank, the surrendering men jumped into the water, swimming for the fanning. Four men became entangled in the radio antenna and were dragged under, but all managed to free themselves. The men of the fanning were throwing lines over the side. Some of the U-58 crew were climbing aboard, but it quickly became obvious that many of the men were near exhaustion. They had to tie a line around themselves and be pulled up like giant fish. One was so exhausted he could not adjust the rope under himself. Two members of Fanning's crew, Chief Pharmacist Mate Elixir Harwell and Coxswain Francis Connor, jumped in to save him. They managed to get him aboard, but he couldn't be resuscitated. U-58 crewman Franz Glinder died on the deck of USS Fanning, the only casualty of what was called the action of 17 November, 1917. According to Admiral Sims, Amberger, dripping wet, walked up to Carpenter, clicked his heels in the most ceremonious German fashion, and surrendered himself, his officers, and his crew. The action represented the first time the United States Navy was confirmed to have sunk an enemy submarine in combat. The entire combat lasted less than 15 minutes. Life was difficult aboard a World War I U-boat, when the crew of U-58 were issued soap by the Americans, a commodity that was in short supply in Germany at the time, it was the first time they'd seen any in month. Given dry clothes, issued cigarettes and rations, and perhaps just happy to be alive, the new prisoners of war broke into song. Captain Amberger later wrote that the Americans were much nicer and more obliging than expected. The U.S. Navy decided to inter the crew of U-58 in the United States, where they thought it would be easier to feed them and much harder for them to escape. For their alert action, Coxswain Loomis and Lieutenant Henry were awarded the Navy Cross. Berrien and Carpenter were both awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. Both men went on to become admirals. And crewmen Harwell and Connor were given written commendations for the efforts to save the German U-boat crewman. Crewman Glinder was buried at sea with full honors. And, in what many crewmen considered to be the greatest honor, Vice Admiral Sir Louis Bailey, the Royal Navy's Commander-in-Chief of the coast of Ireland, granted the crew of the Fanning permission to paint a star on the front funnel, representing the victory. Despite endless hours protecting convoys during the war, the Fanning was one of only two U.S. destroyers to earn that star. The convoy system worked. Merchant vessel losses went down. U-boat losses went up. And despite von Holtendorf's promise, not one U.S. soldier lost their life due to U-boats, as we transported the American Expeditionary Force to France, bringing hope to the beleaguered forces of the Entente Nations. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.